Hello and welcome to Great Britain in Focus. I'm James McCullough. And I'm Pascal Mary Rakovic. We look first at the fascinating story of Julian of Norwich, a devout woman who lived in the 14th century. She confined herself as a hermit to a small cell, devoting her life to unceasing prayer, receiving extensive visions of Jesus in which he conversed with her. She later wrote a book, probably the first ever written by a woman in Europe, containing her meditations on her visions. Called Revelations of Divine Love, her writing is notable in that she conveys to us consolations from a merciful God during a time of great upheaval in Britain. Her legacy is one of bringing comfort to those living through hardship. But in this discussion we learn about her as a person, humble and dedicated to the truth of God's love for us. Welcome back to our History of Christianity series. Let's now fast forward to the 14th century, Joanna. The time is around 1340. We have got uh, the Black Death just about to really kick in to the Britain. It's already gone through Europe. Almost a third of the population of Europe is going to be wiped out. It's also the time just after the, or during the Hundred Years' War, the Battle of Cressy has just happened. These are troubled times. There's also other events going on in, in Britain which are very unsettling. Uh, the throne of Richard II had just been wrested away by Henry IV. We've got the Peasants' Revolt. We've got the Lollards. These are events which are really put down with savagery by the state. Troubled times, but there is a shining light. Who is it? The shining light in these very dark times is Julian. Julian of Norwich. We don't even know her real name. She takes her name from this church, St. Julian's Church here in Norwich, and she actually lived here. Or rather, she lived in a cell embedded in this church. Because during these dark times, when she was about 30, so we're now going to about 1370, 1373, having suffered as a young woman, we think she may even have been married and lost children in the Black Death. Suffering along with everybody else, she had a deep calling from God to live a life of that of a hermit, to live a life of consolation to others and prayer to God, alone, without any of the normal consolations of family or even of a religious community here. In fact, it was more than just being a hermit. It was an anchoress or anchorite. Mm. We're going to now see a reconstruction of the cell that she lived in. Shall I lead on? Go on. So, here we are, this is it. This is the reconstruction of her cell. Now, the original cell would have been much smaller, only 12 foot by 12 foot. Very small space to live in. And you can see the foundations, the original foundations coming out from that wall there. It would have been about 12 foot by 12 foot, a tiny space to live in mm -hmm. for such a long period of time. Mm. So it would have come out here, up along the edge of this altar to a roughly this point, and then here for 12 feet, and then back in again to the wall. Now the interesting thing is that there were only three windows, significant because the first one, called the squint, um, opened up onto the church itself. She never left the cell, but she could observe Mass and receive the Eucharist from that window. The second window would have been facing out in that direction roughly, where her parlour maid, her servant, would bring her food, pass it through the window and receive out the waste and the slops. And then the third window would be out here, towards the outside world. A small window with a curtain across it, where people would know they would come and receive the counselling that she was well known for. The kind words, the reassurances, the prayers. People would queue up outside here to receive that from her. Mm. So what I want to know is, what was the life of an anchorite all about? I think it's something that we can't really understand, except that in the church today, we do have enclosed religious communities of mm. sisters, but there at least they have the community and it's a very vibrant community life. But it's still this idea you're withdrawing from the world to be with God. Mm. And the life of an anchorite was with God. So, as you say, she is at Mass every day receiving the Eucharist. 
but she spent hours and hours in prayer. She didn't even do any cooking or cleaning. The mm. food would be brought to her. So there wasn't even that distraction of, you know, as it were, doing the ironing. Sure. <laughs> she didn't, as far as we know, write letters, although she did write. She wrote the first book to be known by a woman in English. So her writings were a reflection of the visions that she received. She received 16 visions in one night in around about the year uh, 1373. These visions were of Christ standing before her, bleeding. And she spoke to Jesus in these visions and he answered her. And she had a lot of um, questions answered. These she reflected on, and then 20 years later, after these visions, she wrote what we call now the long text, which included her meditations on those visions and, and, and the meaning of them. Um, they bring a lot of consolation to people even now today. Troubled times then, and troubled times now, her writings really apply to us. They really speak to us somehow, I think, across the centuries. Mm. And some of them have become so famous, they're the sort of thing that... Uh, people write to one another or quote. I love the bit where she says that Christ didn't say, you, you will not be tempted, mm. you will not be distressed, you will not uh, be anguished, but you will not be overcome. Yes. You know, there is a strength in it. And from your description, there's this idea that her teaching is tough. It's tough because Christ really was crucified. It mm. wasn't a gentle thing. And her own life, of course, was also, well, you could say, Tough. Very. I mean, <laughs> yes. here in this cell alone, yep. with people pestering you at the window, perhaps when you were deep in prayer, yeah. and people, somebody kind, your maid bringing you food. But this isn't an awful lot of fun, is it? There's no suggestion that it's a roaring log fire in a comfortable library. Not at all. It was this a life as asceticism mm. and almost hankering back to the early church fathers. And I think this yes. is what anchorites were all about. Um, there were about a hundred of them in the sort of twelfth uh, century, and then it started to increase to about two hundred people. Uh, interesting, interestingly enough, there were always far more women anchoresses than there were men anchorites, and it continued right up until the late fifteenth uh, and early sixteenth century. Um, the whole idea of people shutting themselves away, a life of asceticism, uh, praying and giving counsel to people. And it does go back to the Desert Fathers. The idea of a hermit is very much in our, mm. in our tradition. And the idea, too, that what they do, full-time, one could say, prayer, we should also, in some measure, do. We should also, you know, retreat and give time to the Lord. And they're giving the, the example, that, that absolute commitment. It kind of does make sense, although it sounds pretty <laughs> tough to us. Yes. And people still come here here to this cell and had that sense of wonder, I think, that, that we experienced as we, as we walked in. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's rebuilt because the church has got its own story. Yes, tell us about that story. Yes, well, this bit is interesting. This is an ancient church, but it was savagely bombed in mm. the Second World War, virtually right. destroyed. And the door through which we came is actually Norman, but taken from another bombed church. They brought that Norman archway with its curved arch to this church when it was rebuilt, right. and rededicated in 1953 after the Second World War. I see. And then they reconstructed this cell. And it's extraordinary because people are drawn to this corner of Norwich, and there's a great many other things to see in this city, because it's Mother Julian, because it's Julian, and this is her cell. Mm. And the church itself is very loved and, and, and well cared for, and people are drawn to it, but they're drawn particularly to this cell. And I think they have, as we had, a sense of wonder as you walk down the steps and and this is where she was this really is where she was with the window out to the wider city yes so norwich is quite a quiet place now in comparison to what it used to be it was the second largest city outside of london in her day and a bustling commercial center and one reason why the black death affected this city so badly at that time is the wave of commercial migrants coming in from the continent um, purely to be in Norwich, where the, so much trade was happening. Um, that's what made it quite an unusual place. Now, it's a little bit quieter than it was, but still, it draws visitors for a different for reason. For a different reason.
This is really so very So this is sweet. the garden. It's a really nice place to come and pray. Very quiet, and isn't it? It is, yes. Even in the middle of the city and all that. Yes. Absolutely. So just round here to the right is we've got oh. the squint mm -hmm. and the actual place where she would have had her cell. So this is where her window out onto the world would have been. And this is where people would have come to seek her counsel. So tell us a little bit more about the person, Julian. I think she was quite a wise woman. I think she was not an ill-educated uh, peasant. Mm. The fruit of her wisdom was the fruit of pondering that vision. And she was soaked in the scriptures and in the understanding of the church. What she was offering was not homespun wisdom. Right. It was something much more profound. And her writing reveals this. Mm -hmm. I think there was something that indicates this was not just a sort of peasant woman who had a, a vision one time. This is somebody who chose in response to God to, to lead this life. She must have been a woman of some modest means because she had somebody to help her to bring the bread and so on. To so she up. would have had an income of some sort from somewhere maybe. I think so, some family money or as a widow. It's possible people would have given her donations, yes. but equally possible she certainly they would have been very modestly used because she simply went on living in this hermitage. So there's no suggestion she made money. I, I wonder whether she didn't have some money of her own. And there's a sense in which she's often referred to as a sort of Lady Julian, as if mm. somehow there was some understanding and of course, we don't know her name. Mm. She's taken oh. the name Julian. Isn't that touching? It's modest as well. She didn't want to be known. She didn't, she wanted to be quite anonymous. Yes. She was quite a humble woman, I believe. Uh, her words were, um, she could no letter, which means that she's illiterate. Yeah. And clearly she's not. She's our first uh, English speaking authoress uh, that we know in history. It's a very attractive mix. This wisdom, something rather scholarly, mm. but genuinely humble, message for today, where we all think it's me, me all the time. And yet, and yet, all these years later, all these years later, we have her wisdom and we think of people perhaps jostling round, taking turns, you yes. know. Well, there's something awfully sweet about it. And also that peaceful heart of a big city. There's mm. something about all of this which is immensely attractive. And she lived to a great old age. She died in her 70s. Yeah, about 75 roughly. Mm. Um. So there's a story there about a simple, prayerful way of life. It doesn't seem to do you any harm, mm. you know. She lived mm. to a good old age, especially by medieval standards. Mm -hmm. And by the time she died, uh, we're now into the, uh, the next century. We're only 50 or so years off the great battle in 1485, which sees the end of one royal dynasty and the start of a new one, the Tudors. Right, so this will be our next programme. <laughs> we look forward to this. We're going to cover the Tudors. We'll be talking about possibly the start of some of the English martyrs. Yes, and we take forward from there. And it's a strange thing to see that that's only all oh, half a century after Julian of Norwich. So we yes. end on that, a very peaceful note. Uh, and then we see, I suppose it's always happening in history, isn't it? The next, the next chapter and the tragedies of the, of the Reformation and so on. Until then. On we go. On we go. We now hear Teresa Young speaking to us about her uncle, John Bradburn, an English Third Order Franciscan who was brutally killed in what is now Zimbabwe in 1979. Known as the Vagabond of God, he spent his life searching for God and devoted his final years to caring for those suffering from leprosy in appalling conditions. Let's hear about this man's life and his example of how to love. Hello, today in the studio we have Teresa Young, who is the niece of John Bradburn, the Englishman who was martyred in Africa in 1979. Teresa, welcome to the EWTN studios here in Walsingham. Thank you very much. John Bradburn is a name known to some, but not to all. Um, he was born in 1922 in England mm. and he died in Zimbabwe or then Rhodesia in 1979 and he died a violent death. Mm. How would you sum up his life? Well, he was searching, always looking, searching for God. So he was always on the move. He was sort of just one place to the next. So that, that would be until he finally reached his place. Now that search um, entails two continents, Europe and Africa, and um, he's a kind of modern day Joseph Labore almost, in Europe anyway, because he drifts from pillar to post, mm. 
from county to county, from to, to, to London, mm. and then he drifts around Europe before ending up in southern Africa, in then Rhodesia, where he comes to a particular place in Africa, which is to be his destiny, to be his home. Where was that? Well, he landed finally, the last 10 years of his life, at a place called Motemwa, which was a place for leprosy, people living with leprosy. And um, a friend of his took him out there, Heather Benoy. And Heather had heard about this place and said, John, shall we go and take a look? And they, so they went together. And as soon as John went there, they, they were both actually horrified at the situation that they found there. What did they find? Oh, gosh. Well, people suffering, people uncared for, people sick, people grubby, hungry, just uh, almost abandoned in a way, not just physically, but spiritually. And it was awful. And all suffering from leprosy? Leprosy, I b believe so. I mean, there may have been some that were, you know, homeless or whatever, I don't know at that time. But it was a place for leprosy, Motemwa, which is a big granite rock, you know, across the valley. You've got Chigona, then you've got the, the, the le settlement, and then across there you've got Motemwa Mountain, and that's called You Are Cut Off. And leprosy patients would come from all over Africa, Malawi, Mozambique. They used to be huge at that granite Mutemwa. And then it sort of got smaller, 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 and it ended up this little community right below Chigona. Yes, uh, there's a, there is a courage in John's life that he followed his path mm. to the end. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about his death. Well, gosh, you know... You know, before he died, he was, you know, people said, John, you better, you better get out of here. You're going to get taken out. And um, he just wouldn't go. He wouldn't leave them. And even Father Fidelis was saying that if, when he took him back the last time he saw him, he said, if I take you away, he said, don't matter about that, I'll just walk back. He wasn't going to leave his friends. I mean, what greater thing to risk your own life in which and ultimately you die for your friends. He, it didn't worry him. I understand that. It doesn't matter anymore. The closer you get to God, this life doesn't matter. You just focus on the one. Phew. Nothing else matters. Dying doesn't matter. What do you do when you die? You cross over to eternal life with God. It's no big deal. I guess there's, there was, I mean, just as you're saying that, yeah. the, I mean, the, what was ultimately a martyrdom of John. Mm. But in some ways he'd been preparing for it all his life because yeah. he was constantly just starting yeah. again, wasn't he? He yeah. was leaving one yeah. place, going to another place. Yeah. Yeah. He was constantly sort of moving. Yeah. As you say, he would take the shirt off his back. Yeah. He was a man with very few possessions yeah. by all accounts. So yes. the only thing he possessed really was his own life. And yes. even that he had sacrificed it in a way to those that he served. Mm. But the actual killing of John was a very brutal and a very bloody affair. And, and it must have been a very, very, even for somebody like John, must yeah. have been an absolutely terrifying, yes. and horrible experience. Yes, I think so in, in that. But I think what probably got him through was prayer. I mean, they, they abducted him in the night and they took him off and took him off into the Bundu and towards Gwaze, which is where there are some caves, to go and interrogate him to see what do we do with this guy. And um, so he had that long walk. He was taken. It's all so Christ-like in a way. So Christ gets taken, he goes through, and you have the agony of what's coming. And so, you know, John was marched off. He was taken off, and he had to, he didn't know what was going to happen to him. But, and they tortured him and, and tormented him, you know, when, you know, that first stop that he had, and, you know, people were horrid to him, you know, mocking him offering him women and whatnot, but it was dreadful. And, and so then, then they marched on, they got to Guaze. And um, so he just went with the flow. He just knew this, you just, that was his path, his journey. And, you know, and he met Anna Guaze, the, the daughter of the chief of Guaze on the way. And, and John had stopped to rest and he, she, he was sitting down and Anna came down the path, and he said hello, and he greeted her, and 
would you like to pray? So Anna was, she said, yes, let's pray. So we, they prayed together at that spot where John was resting, which was very near the caves. And uh, then they was taken off to the caves and, and the, in the end they decided, look, this, we, you can't, don't you do this, don't you spill this man's blood here. Don't let him go. And he's a good man. He's looking after our people. And then they offered him to go to Mozambique and said, do you want to come with us? You can look after our lot. And he said, no, I'm going to Mutemwa. I need to go there. So anyway, he got back to the, they took him back to the main road. And um, the ones that the Mojibas that thought that he'd seen too much and it was going to be too risky that he's alive. And they shot him. And so, do you know what you say? The actual end was quick. You know, some people suffer for years suffering, dying. John's was quick, really. Although the life, his life before was a searching. There's a sort of a suffering and not knowing. There's the cloud of unknowing, really. But um, the actual death, dead, gone. Do you think, was it one of John's desires to die a martyr death? Yes, definitely. He wanted to be, be buried in this Franciscan, die a martyr, work with lepers, and be buried in the Franciscan habit. Teresa, what would you hope for John in the coming years? Well, I think, first of all, he needs to be recognised by the church as a martyr, because that's what he was. You know, when you're a martyr, you die, you, know, you won't abandon those who you, you know, his faith and those that he was looking after. So I think, number one, the next step, please, God willing, that he is recognised as the martyr. And from following that, then I think, you know, sainthood, canonization. You know, but there's a process there. You know, so there needs to things that need to happen in, in that, and testimonies and miracles and that sort of thing. But they've got so many testimonies. They've got so many things that have happened, and they're happening all the time. You go to Botemwa on the 5th of September, you climb up Chigona and do that all-night vigil. The prayers, the testimonies, the papers that people... You know, I get people saying to me, did you know this, that John, th this happened and this was sick and, and then it was better. You know, so the, all the testimonies are gathered. So now because of coronavirus, it's, the things had to slow down a little bit with, with interviewing these people. And so, but hopefully now it needs to pick up, it needs to go. So martyrdom and then it, the testimonies and, and ultimately to canonize him. And you know, it's, it's not what, it, John was really, you know, if you read this in here, that he wrote to Father Dove, and I marked it out here, and this is really important to, to listen to this. It says, pray on for my sanctification too. Now this is a private letter from John, to, from my Uncle John to Father John Dove. It's 25th of September, 1952. So he wanted it. He wanted to become a saint, but for this re not so much for the glory of John, although as a kid he used to be a little bit like that, but as a mature man it was more for this. Pray on for my sanctification too, because it would encourage so many souls, so encourage so many souls, if such a wreckage might come to canonization. And, uh, and then his humour comes in, and I do so want to bypass purgatory. But, um, so it's really to encourage others. And I think that, that is number one reason for, you know, making John a saint, to encourage others. You know, let's go forward, let's, let's all go forward in love of, in, for God, you know, the way he was. And let's care for, for those who do not have anything. I would like to make one more point, if I may, if that's all right, Kevin. You know, we can't do this without support for the John Bradman Memorial Society. We need support to go forward, to take John's cause forward. So, and that's based here in England, so please support the John Bradman Memorial Society. Well, thank you very much, Teresa, for coming to the studios here in Walsingham. Thank you very much for your testimony about your, your uncle, yeah. and uh, we pray too that uh, his great sanctity will be recognised by the Church, and that his death will be a witness in these dark times, yeah. a witness to hope, to faith, 
and above all to love. Mm. So thank you very much for coming to the studios mm. and talking about your Uncle John. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Full versions of these interviews will be made available soon on our social media channels. If you feel you would like to donate to support the mission of EWTN in Great Britain, please visit our website ewtn.co.uk. Thank you for joining us. Do join us next time. Goodbye and God bless. Thank you.